Can I just say, first of all, I love how you pronounce my name. It's, it's so weird because I, you know, it's it, it, like because in South Africa we have Carabo, and then in Africa obviously we have Caramo and a chase, but then like, and then people here are like Caramo. Yeah. And then, <laughs> but then I, I, I say it the way that you actually talk about this in the book. Yes. Which, by the way, is truly, truly fascinating as far as someone's life story goes. Thank you. Um, we, can, we, may, we may even start with that. You, 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 you get this name, you, you, you're given this name by your parents, and for the, the, the most of your life, you grew up in Texas, you, you hated the name that you had, why? Completely, I mean, you're, I'm growing up in predominantly white neighborhoods with immigrant parents, and was going to schools where um, my name was not special. It was perceived different, people made fun of it, and as a child, you just wanna fit in. You don't wanna be seen as different, right. you just want right. to. And so, you know, in the comfort of my home, I loved my name, my father said it like you. Right. And so I loved it, but then the minute I got to school and teachers would say Karambo or Kamumu or whatever, right. it, it, you know, it kills your self-esteem. And so uh, I had to learn and grow to love all parts of myself and my name being the first challenge. That really is, for me, the theme of this book. You know, the title says it all, My Story of Embracing Purpose, Healing, and Hope. But it really is a story about embracing yourself as a person. That's what, that's what I connected to in the book, because you tell this tale of how you grew up in a world where you felt like you were always on the outside. Yep. You then go to a predominantly black university, and, and all of a sudden you feel like you have a connection and a feeling. But as a young gay man, you also had a journey that you had to go on. Completely. I mean, my life was riddled with challenge after challenge after challenge because of my identities, from having immigrant parents to being a black man to being a gay man to having so many different issues. And it, it was me constantly trying to figure out how to navigate the love that I had for myself. It's right. the same thing I do with the heroes on Queer Eye, of helping them to dig deep and find the love in themselves. And that's what I do with this book. It's about being open and transparent about, though I'm here at this space, I had to work through that to get to this place right. Where right, I am right, now. Right. And if I can do it, anyone out of there can do it. Any of you friends can do it. Trust and believe. It really is. It really is a book that is transparent. You know, I, I didn't know what to expect when I picked it up, but but you speak in depth about growing up in a home with domestic abuse. Mm -hmm. And while you yourself weren't abused personally, you still experienced this abuse in the household. And what really struck me is, is a part in the book where you talk about something that I could really relate to, where you talk about how you didn't realize that you were becoming like the abusive father that you were so afraid of and, and, and despised so much. Yeah. Explain what that actually means. Well, you know, my father was abusive to my mother, and though he never hit me, I grew up in a household where I knew abuse was prevalent. But as I was growing up, I was always taught men don't hit women. Right. But the conversation, how do you have that when the little boy is not going to engage with women, he's gonna engage with other men. Right. And so as I got older, anytime I would have anger issues or feel betrayed or hurt, I had been told my entire life, it's okay to hit another boy. That's what men do, men fight. Right. And so now I'm in these relationships where I then would get upset and I was hitting my partners and was becoming my father in essence. And what I realize is um, through research is that domestic violence in the LGBT community is higher than it is in straight communities. Yet it's never talked about because police aren't trained, social workers aren't trained enough, nurses aren't trained enough. And so people in LGBT couples are experiencing domestic violence and are not getting any support or help. You actually talk about one of your relationships where you were abusive to one of your partners and the police got called in. Yeah. And they basically just dismissed it. Completely. I sat arrogantly at the door thinking, looking at my partner who was hurting and saying, oh yeah, call the police. They're not gonna do anything. And just like I thought, the police came to the door and they saw two men and they said, oh, you all just work it out. You, right. you, you two friends work it out. They didn't even have the language or the ability to say you are in a cup in a relationship. Yes. And you know, obviously, I've grown past that. I've asked for forgiveness from all my partners. I've worked on my um, anger issues. And and you know, these are things I'm expressing there because I want people at home to see if I can really look transparently at myself and say, this is who I was. But I want to be better. I want to grow through this then anyone else can do it. And I think that's a key message that people need to hear and understand. It, it really is a beautiful message that, that, that you're delivering in the book and in your life. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's only fitting that you became a father in, honestly, one of the most <laughs> bizarre circumstances ever. <laughs> yeah. This, you, you discovered that you had a son from a girlfriend f from, really, a previous life that you had. Yeah. The... But, 
This is a 10 year old child that comes into your life. Yeah, the first and last girl I dated, we lost her virginity together. And um, after we were done, I was like, never doing that again. Um, <laughs> and then she moved away. It was like, you know, this is before the advent of the internet as we know it yes, today. Yes, so yes. if you didn't have a house phone or, and I'm not that old, or, you know, an address, it was like they were gone. And so 10 years later, I was coming home from this event in this drug stupor and there was a stack of papers on my doorstep and now I was on MTV's Real World before and I thought they were doing some punked version for the real world and I thought like oh they're punking the gay guy making him think he has a kid so I thought Ashton Kutcher was in my house and I I went downstairs changed because I was excited to meet Ashton and Ashton wasn't in there um, <laughs> just a bill for a child I didn't even know about and had to go on this journey to, um, first of all, figure out who I was because I was still a child trying to raise myself, right. realizing that I had to raise this child, but then also figuring out how to navigate with his mother so that we could communicate and co-parent for our child to have the best life possible. And luckily it worked out. Um, she and I are in great space. She's an amazing woman. I got full custody of my son. I then adopted his younger brother. So I became a father of two. And um, now my boys are 12 and 18, but I got them at 10 and seven. And so, you know, it's just been quite a journey to fatherhood. It really has been quite a journey for yeah. you. Queer Eye is a breakthrough success. Yeah. I mean, I remember when it started on Netflix and instantly everyone was just like, what is this? And other people were like, it's back. <laughs> everyone loves it across the board. What do you think the success of Queer Eye owes its, you know, what, what do you think it owes its success to? Is, is there something about how you all act authentically on the show? Is it about the fact that you're all different? What do, what do you think it is that connects with people? I think it's all of those things. I think, first of all, it's a very diverse cast. The first cast wasn't that diverse. First of all, the first show was amazing. Right. I love those guys. They paved a path for us, but we're very very diverse in our ages, in our races, in our cultural backgrounds, in our gender expressions to the right. world. Um, also, you know, I, I, I applaud myself as well because I sort of led the charge as bringing more emotion. Like, you know, um, what my, the other four guys do are exceptional. I could never design a house. I could never cut someone's hair unless you want me to give you an edge up. You know, <laughs> I mean, you look good, but I'll try, you know, try it. But I just um, got queer eyed. Exactly. No, no, you look good. You look good. <laughs> Um, but one of the things is that I say you can change the exterior, but unless you figure out why you haven't cut your hair in 20 years, why you haven't fixed your home in 10 right, years, right, right. then the problem is just going to reoccur. And I think people are really latching on to the emotional attachment. You know, like one of our things is, you know, people are crying a lot. And I'm, I'm proud to say that part of the interaction I have with our heroes is bringing out those emotional moments and allowing people to see that they can grow through their issues. Well, honestly, if people don't love you already, they're going to love you even more from reading this book. Uh, excited for Queer Eye. It's always on Netflix. And uh, I'm excited for, to listen to your new podcast that's coming out. Thank you for being on the yes, show, man. Yes, yes, Really podcast, excited, man. Yes. Season three of Queer Eye launches on Netflix March 15th. His memoir is available now. Karamo Brown, everybody.